Folks, welcome to another episode of the Locked On Pit Podcast. Today, I'm going to welcome in John Garcia Jr. talking recruiting, folks. A lot on the plate today. We got BJ Williams committing on Friday. Kenny Minchie talking with some other schools right now, or at least hearing from other schools and an official, unofficial visitor with the dead period officially over. But as always, want to welcome in John Garcia Jr. John, welcome to the show. Good to be back on with you, Nick. We, we tried to tell people Kenny was going to get phone calls. We tried We tried to tell him he's a legitimate quarterback in this class, top five for us at the Elite 11. I mean, here we are. So so we'll see how it goes. But, uh, again, another – all of this is complimentary to Pitt, you know, and I think no matter how it shakes out, that's something that should be communicated as much as possible. Absolutely should be communicated and folks i'd like to thank linkedin jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the entire locked on college network linkedin jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply and john let's kick it off with kenny minchie because i think right now you look at this pit recruiting class he's obviously the key member of this thing and and it, it's not not that Pitt doesn't have a good recruiting class. I think they got a good one building. But Kenny Minchie, a four-star quarterback, now consensus so, a consensus four-star quarterback across the board after his late 11 performance. We've heard some reports come out that it sounds like Notre Dame is in this. Uh, and and I, something I also can't help but notice is Ohio State is a team that's had a little bit of trouble kind of getting in on some of these. You know, Austin Novosaw, does, they've tried to get in on him. Brock Glenn, it sounds like they've tried to get in on him. But – Maybe we've heard rumblings of Kenny Minchie there as well. What about these teams could maybe draw Kenny Minchie away? And how firm do you think this commitment to Pitt is for Kenny Minchie? Well, look, I, you know, I talked to Kenny in the spring. I talked to him again in the summer at the Elite 11. Just checking in, right? Because we're reporters at the end of the day. Hey, hey, Kenny, anybody giving you a call? We really like what you're doing. I'm assuming other people see what we see. Anybody giving you a call? And he said no out in L.A. at the end of June. But what has happened since then? You mentioned it. Austin Novosad, Brock Glenn, Dante Moore, guys that Ohio State and Notre Dame were considering or in on altogether started to make more decisions. Brock Glenn looks like he's going to be relegated to the South Florida State, Auburn, probably the top two there. Dante Moore, Michigan kid, the best quarterback in the Midwest, probably by a margin. Uh, pops to Oregon, right? Over Notre Dame, over Ohio State, over Texas A&M. So all of a sudden, the quarterback dominoes shift once again. Austin Novosad commits to Baylor in December. Kind of like Kenny Minchie has his, this amazing offseason after a great 2021 season, more offers come in. More schools are like, hey, we could flip this kid. And now he'll visit Notre Dame on Tuesday. He'll be back at Baylor this weekend. And his final group is Baylor, Notre Dame, Ohio State, uh, as well as Texas A&M, where both of his parents went. So you're hearing the same teams involved with the same kids. But Ohio State and Notre Dame are maybe having the hardest time with that traction. And I think part of the reason is, one, because the front end of their quarterback room, pretty good, right? We expect both of them to be very good at the quarterback position this year and probably beyond when their starters move on. And then each school also has an elite, maybe number one and two in the country, quarterbacks for the class of 2024. Uh, So I think that hurts your recruiting in 2023 because naturally there's already a guy with more fanfare, more expectation committed behind you. So Dylan Rayola at Ohio State, CJ Carr, at Notre Dame. So now it's, it's this, how do we find a guy in 2023? And even those programs who are recruiting so well at every position, playoff contenders, all that stuff, they're even, they're struggling because of the business of college football recruiting at the quarterback spot. So naturally it was only a matter of time before the board filtered into the Kenny Minchie territory. So we're we're there now Uh, last week uh, or two weeks ago, actually, I was first tipped off. Hey, Notre Dame could get involved with Kenny, uh, which means Ohio State, other schools could potentially make those phone calls as well. But again, talking to Kenny, he said he was solid with Pitt, comfortable with his decision and and honestly, like brushed it off at the time. Now, again, do Notre Dame and Ohio State offers or, or communication, should they make you make a phone call or take a phone call that you weren't planning on taking? Probably, right? I mean, I think we could all understand 
that that's a big deal. But just like Novosad with Baylor, and there's a lot of buzz that this kid might stick with Baylor. I think the early evaluation, the early benefit of the doubt, and the early commitment to Pitt is really important in this conversation because Kenny's kind of a quiet kid, a little bit more reserved, lets his play do the talking. So not one that you would automatically vault as a candidate to make this huge shocking flip at the end of, of the recruiting process. Not saying it's impossible, but I do think it's a more of an uphill battle than these schools maybe realize, not only because of their own situations and being so loaded at the position, but also the, the reciprocated f- factor of these quarterbacks who have a chip on their shoulder, who were jumping on board with programs that bought in months and, and sometimes years earlier. Uh, so I think that's a real factor to to push against uh, for these schools. So it's going to be fascinating for Ohio State and Notre Dame in particular with their entire quarterback board, not just Kenny Minchie. But if you're a Pitt fan, which if you're listening to this show, you're either in my family or a Pitt fan, uh, you should probably watch Austin Novosad and Brock Glenn you know, because both of those guys overlap with that Ohio State Notre Dame board. I think Glenn is going to come off the board first, Novosad probably in the next few weeks or so. Um, and, and then I think, you know, those dominoes can either close the door on one of those schools trying to really push for Minchie or leave it a little bit open. And, and then they start to go all in for, for Pitt's quarterback commitment. So it'll be fascinating, but like usual with quarterbacks, keep an eye on the other guys because they'll kind of help you formulate, you know, I guess the level of worry or panic that that could be uh, coming towards some of the Pitt faithful. Yeah. And I, I know that Minchie, this is a real buzz getter for Pitt in terms of what he did in the Elite 11. He was phenomenal there, was in the top 11 of the Elite 11. That's really the first time I can remember Pitt ever having a kid in there. And he was truly underrated and came out of nowhere. Pitt got in on him early. This was a really good evaluation job by Pitt, but you are starting to hear those rumbles a little bit of other teams. But I do remember when he committed, he said, wanted to get it over with. He didn't like the recruiting process. This is not something he likes. He wanted to get it over with. Pitt was the school he liked, and so he went with it. So I, I, I'm interested to see how that plays into this all because maybe Minchie is less, as, as I said, disincentivized to go to an Ohio State or a Notre Dame because he feels like he's already done. And it sounds almost like by some of the responses you got, John, that might be what this is. It very well could be. You know, I, I think that's, again, what's the, the ego is – is everything in this college football recruiting process. You know, some kids commit early and they feel like, man, I missed out on, on being a recruit, being that coveted, getting all the love kind of kid. So they decommit to try to experience it or some do it in the transfer portal, right? The, the ego certainly has something to be fed, but when that has already happened, like is the case for Minchie, there is a dismissiveness about it. So really Even if you're watching these other kids, which you should, again, Brock Glenn, Austin Novosad, check them out. Great kids, great players. Different than Kenny Minchie, too, which is interesting stylistically for Ohio State and Notre Dame. But watch the visits. If Kenny starts to set up visits, you know, then you could start to panic a little bit more, uh, per se. But until that point, I I wouldn't worry too much about it. I do believe Minchie's been to Notre Dame uh, earlier in, in his uh, recruitment, maybe uh, last summer uh, for a camp, something in that light, but uh, nothing considerable with this this reconstructed coaching staff in South Bend. Um, so, so that would certainly be the one that I would be a little bit more interested in if I'm a Pitt fan than Ohio State, because Ohio State has seemingly been in on more targets than Notre Dame. Notre Dame, it's like Austin Novosad, maybe a little bit of Kenny Minchie. Ohio State was in on Dante Moore, in on Dylan Lonergan, in on Eli Holstein, in on Brock Glenn, in on Nova Sad. It's just a wider net with Ohio State, a little bit more narrow for ND. So I do think that's the school. If you had to pick one that maybe you should consider it more of a threat if all of these things materialize simultaneously, it would probably be the Irish uh, in that light. But again, I think Kenny is the type of kid like Nova Sad to kind of say, okay, cool. I mean, I appreciate it, but but maybe no thanks, especially given his demeanor, given, like you said, when he committed that he was happy to be done. Um, And that freedom kind of translates when you watch Kenny throw. I mean, he's just relaxed. The demeanor is just here. 
He's got he's got the woosah going at all times. Nothing really bothers him. So if there's a kid who's kind of built to handle the increased attention, which is going to come with scrutiny and dumb college football fans tweeting recruits and all that stuff that makes it the ugly side of, of the sport. If there's a kid built to handle those elements, it, it would be Kenny Minchie, which is why I think he's a great quarterback and why I think it's it shouldn't surprise us to see other schools trying what, whatever they can to, to stay in the mix for him, even if it's just a, as a hypothetical. And we'll see what happens with that, if anything develops or if Minchie just stays solid and signs and ends up on Pitt's campus. We will see what happens there. But Pitt did get a commit on Friday, and B.J. Williams, we'll talk about him. But first, folks, I want to let you know about LinkedIn Jobs because as the sun comes out and small businesses are back in business, LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier to grow your team. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the people you want to interview faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. There are simple tools like screen questions that make it easier to focus on the candidates you want. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs the number one in delivering quality hires versus their leading competitors. So LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster, folks. Over 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn every week. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, John. We got to talk about another pit commit because this one came out of nowhere. It was a road – it was right after – the, uh, the official visit season had ended and Pitt got a rogue Monday commit that no one, and I mean this, no one had a clue who it was. This kid tried to keep it under the radar and it was a flip. BJ Williams from Memphis has flipped to Pitt, took an official visit in the second week, a very under the radar official visit that didn't really get out. Uh, and he goes from Memphis to Pitt, doesn't have a crazy off sheet, Syracuse, Kansas, uh, you have Army, Navy, a few other teams, Memphis in there. This is an interesting pickup for Pitt. Their fifth offensive lineman in this class, John. I think that's what what you said there at the end is is really where my brain went when this pickup was announced, and I knew we'd be talking about it today. This is a great supplementary pickup for the Panthers' offensive line. Look, when you're building an offensive line class, we talk about it at receiver and in the secondary, right? When you're building an offensive line class, there has to be a natural stack, whether it's a positional breakdown of this is the group of tackles, this is the group of interior guys, or a stagger of how soon these guys are ready to play. You know, you, you've got your, your guys who are ready day one, and maybe your guys who year two, year three are more in line to help you on Saturdays. So you've got to stagger that group. And I think Pitt's done a really nice job of that. They've got this nice combination of linemen who are taller and leaner. Then they've got some some bigger, more physically ready to play guys uh, in the fold as well. So I think BJ here comes kind of in between. He's built like more of a project, 6'3", 6'4", 280 or so. Look, very well distributed weight, carries it well, run heavy offense. So he's a mauler. He's a great run blocker. The leverage is there. He's athletic and lateral enough to reach block, even on the backside at left tackle, which are all extremely coveted things at the position, but a little bit more raw as a pass blocker. Uh, the, the, what he is asked to do at the high school level down in, in, in the state of Georgia is not at the highest level relative to spread football, zone blocking, and, and combating these smaller, quicker edge rushers that all of college football is trying to deal with. So I do think foundationally, and from a height and weight standpoint, this is a really solid get. And I think the floor is going to be nice here. But in terms of his ceiling, I'm, I'm not quite sure how long it will take for that technique to catch all the way up and then how that will affect his actual position projection. Because I think you can make the case that, that he's most – athletic at tackle but he's got his floor suggests that he could play inside and be one of these move guard prospects that you start to run behind and you and you draw up screens and pulls for because he's a little bit more compact and a little bit more um, comfortable on the run so he's he's an interesting prospect to see develop not only as a senior but obviously once he gets to pit i um, curious at, at that legitimate height and length and then just how much weight he can carry and still be kind of classified as this great 
movement based offensive lineman who's not just a phone booth mauler uh, or a guy who who eats up space this is a different kind of prospect who fits the modern style in terms of his body composition more so than than the old school style so i think in that regard this is another smart evaluation for pitt especially when you talk about him as maybe the fourth or fifth piece on this offensive line as opposed to being the headliner that you're going to count on day one once he gets up to pittsburgh yeah, you talk about that, and it's an interesting offensive line class for Pitt. You know, Philip Dans is a really good pull out of Ohio. Uh, Ryan Coretta is a really strong pull out of there. You like Colin Van Roy. Again, the offer sheet really isn't there for Van Roy, isn't really there for Ty Ray, but those are two guys you like. And then B.J. Williams is kind of this top, top – and then the cherry on top that they're obviously waiting for to see is Stan Ramiel. But that's going to be a question mark, whatever. But they have their five here. They're done unless Ramiel – commits essentially is what they have here what do you make of this offensive line class you kind of have the two headliners what i would consider in coretta and daniels you have upside picks in van roy and ray and then williams who's kind of fits in with them the offer sheets aren't there for those latter three how does that kind of i guess for a team like pitt what do you make of that is it just them trusting their own evaluation and or are they looking for a certain skill set i think it's a combination of both uh like like we talked about you want to stagger it from a physicality standpoint. And, and yeah, you mentioned Daniels looks ready to go right now. Uh, Coretta and Ray from a height weight standpoint, feel like they're closer to, to playing right now. And I think Van Roy is a little bit lighter, a little bit leaner. BJ certainly is in terms of the, that long-term development uh, arc that we see that this position go through at the collegiate level. But yeah, I think this is a good group, a complimentary group. I think you've got some polish uh, you, you've got high floors. I think Daniels has a high floor and a high ceiling. Uh, you, you know how high I am on, on Van Roy. I think he's in maybe the most underrated player in, in this entire pit class. I think Ray is a bit of a project technically. Uh, BJ could be a little closer to that vein, although Ray, to me, pure tackle. BJ can absolutely work inside. And then Coretta is one who probably doesn't have as high a ceiling, but that floor is really rock solid. He might be your right tackle of the future at Pitt. So you could, you almost want to construct an offensive line. And, and if, if you had to here, I think you could, you would ask BJ to, to maybe learn how to take some snaps at center. And then you would flank him uh, with Daniels uh, and, and Van Roy, who's so great on the move. And then you've got uh, Coretta and Ray uh, as your tackles down the line, left or right for both of them. And I think that's, Something, if you could even create that hypothetical without a whole lot of thought, I think you've built a pretty nice offensive line class. And I think that's the one position where you, you have to trust your evaluations the most because it's never going to be sexy. It's never going to be, oh my gosh, look at all these amazing players that everybody can see is amazing. It's easy to sell that with a receiver who runs four three and 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 blows the top off of defenses or a running back that jukes everybody out of their shoes or that pass rusher who has 20 sacks as a senior you don't have to really sell that. But for the offensive line group, you have to sell every element of a skill set and then mold it to the, the guy next to him, which is just, it's so unique uh, in, in football. Maybe the most unique pairing in football is, is building offensive line groups because they are so dependent on that next guy in, in addition to, to their own responsibility. So it is quite fascinating and that's again to me that's the position you got to trust your gut the most and coach barbs deserves uh, some shout outs here i know uh when bj committed that was i think the first guy that he mentioned on, on twitter um this is a good group and and pitt has a style that is is so close to the, what every modern system is trying to reflect that i think that he's one of these coaches that probably deserves a little bit more love in building that benefit of the doubt because uh, th this is a good group and, and he's obviously proven on the field that uh, he can do it pretty well as well. Yeah. Pitt obviously losing a lot of their super seniors this year, Carter Warren, Marcus Minor, Owen Drexel, uh, Gabe Hoy, all will be gone after this year. That's four of their five starting offensive linemen. So this was a key offensive line class for Pitt to restock the shelves, if you will. John, though, I do want to transition over to not even a 23 guy, not even a 24 guy, 2025 we are talking about here. It's very early to talk about him, but Jamie French is, is a little bit different for most Pitt fans. You'll probably recognize that name because you'll see two Fs on it. And, yeah, that's the brother of Maurice French who played at Pitt, of course, for his entire career, was great here, was a set the, the program record for receptions in a season. Maurice French was great here. This is his brother, 
who already has crazy offers. We're talking Alabama is on that offer sheet. It, but he came to pit right now, right? The dead period's over, and he came up to pit on his unofficial today. Loved it. John, first of all, when you have an offer sheet like this kid, I'm talking about blue bloods on blue bloods are on his offer sheet right now. For him to come up to pit, obviously he's probably going to be more dispositioned to do it because of Maurice and all of that. But this is big for pit. This projects to be at least by offer sheet right now, a kid that could be a four star, maybe even higher. Yeah, this is one of the best young players that, that I've scouted to date uh, class of 25, as you mentioned. So finished up his freshman season now going into his sophomore season in high school. And that sounds so young to so many, but sometimes you could just tell. And I think the first time I saw JC, he was, I think, seventh grader going into eighth grade, playing on seven on seven on like this 15U team. And he was like the biggest and most athletic player out there who has this, this polish that you just don't expect at the position. But then you take a deeper look into him, as you mentioned, Big Bro was a pretty darn polished wide receiver as well. He comes from the Jacksonville area, which has a lot of great trainers and seven-on-seven programs. And he plays with Birch Sports, which is one of the best in the state of Florida. So he's a guy we've been able to see work against Power 5 competition since he was in middle school. And even back then, Jamie was doing it. I mean, he was setting up DBs, coming underneath with great length and great hands uh, and some speed to go along with it. Uh, he's got great size. Uh, when I met him, he was probably my height. I'm like 5'10", and now he's legitimately 6'1". I mean, he's just shot right up. And he, he's maintained all of those athletic traits uh, that, that made him so intriguing early in his career, and, and that's why word has spread so quickly uh, around with him. You know, he's in the state of Florida, obviously – Pretty easy to get exposure when you're great in that state. Um, and everyone's bought it. You know, like you said, he's, he's, his offer list is as good as it gets in the class of 25. And, and yeah, Pitt has offered. Pitt has a unique connection with his brother. And yeah, it's been reciprocated with an early visit. And that is invaluable. You know, the kids who are most likely to commit early are the ones who have the biggest offer lists very early. Um, and then you think about connections to schools. Those can really be separators when you're looking at a bunch of schools that want you and what could be different uh, about Pitt we've talked about it on this show I think Pitt offers a more city it, it does offer a more city vibe than all the other schools on his offer sheet you know it's it's like Pitt and Miami uh, among those that I scanned that have a city feel to them uh, so I think that is something for the kid from Jacksonville who's well traveled that is something I think that could resonate. And then we talk about Tyquan Underwood. He's, he's this emerging wide receiver recruiter. The Pitt offense has, again, done so well of late. Obviously, Jordan Addison, the Blitnikoff winner last year. I mean, there's just so many things that should keep Pitt in this conversation uh, for wide receivers. It's the one position, I think quarterbacks becoming the second, where you're like, yeah, Pitt should probably be involved here. So I think the connection gets you the early visit. And, and yeah, French, he told me that everything went well. He said he really loved it. And, and I think what's interesting is that he isolates the people at Pitt. You know, it's easy to say, look at all these trophies and look, look Aaron Donald and all this great stuff that, that has come through this program. They have Dan Marino to take it way back and everything in between. Um, but when you start talking about the people first, I think it says a lot uh, about what you're looking for during the recruiting process. And I think that that's that's what's interesting about French is, is that he mentioned the staff first and how he was treated on the trip. You know, even though you're a big name 2025 with offers, you go to school X and the SEC for a visit, let's say you might not get time with that head coach. You might not get time with a group of coaches. He's mentioned multiple coaches to me in, in terms of that first physical impression of, of this group at Pitt. And that stuff, again, can resonate down the line. Um, ACC territory type of kid, certainly familiar even beyond his family. So, again, some of those things are early built in advantages that Pitt could have in this race as well. Going to be uphill, probably going to be a long term type of recruitment. Uh, but to be in the door with a visit under your belt this early does say a lot about Pitt, even with his connections to the school. Yeah, we're talking an offer sheet, Alabama, Florida, Florida State, Georgia, Miami, Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State, Texas A&M, West Virginia. I mean, we are talking a big offer sheet here in terms of blue bloods in there and SEC blue bloods. But Pitt's in on this. 
different offer sheet from Maurice, that's for sure, when Pitt got him. But Maurice <laughs> turned out pretty good uh, for Pitt, I'll say the least, now playing in the NFL, of course. Uh, so that is a, a success story. And you, every time you see Jamie pop up with Pitt stuff, Maurice is there, which I, I can't, I, it can't hurt, John. It can't hurt for the brother to be in his ear. That's for sure. 100%. You know, and this is, again, this is a humble kid. Can you, you talk to, and he gets it. He gets that it's a business and he's going to navigate it as well as he can this early on. So again, you know, he's a kid who could overlook, could have overlooked Pitt and nobody would have batted an eye. Like you said, Maurice didn't have this offer list. So it would be understandable. Like, Hey, little bro, go, you know, Bama, Georgia, Ohio state, go, go to those schools. We get it. Cause you know, I didn't have that opportunity. Uh, but instead Pitt is, is right in the thick of this at least early on. And, and I think that says a lot about Jamie as well, you know, where he could see the bigger picture and that it doesn't have to be a certain logo on your uniform to get you where, where you need to go. It could be a, a variety of them, including some that you might have some sentimental, sentimental value with. So you start supplementing that with some tangible, Hey, we want you independent of your brother type of stuff, uh, which I'm sure is, is refreshing for Jamie. Um, it, it really could resonate this early in the process. And, and I think it makes you think Pitt should have some staying power in this race. We will see how that develops. Obviously long time out 25 is still yeah. a long time away, but early on to have a visit in the 25 class that says something this early on, especially right out of the dead period meant it was a priority. Uh, to come about john as always great stuff man tell them where they can find your stuff read your stuff follow you all that good stuff yeah real simple nick si.com slash college or check us out on social at john garcia underscore jr folks as always thank you for watching the locked on pit podcast and as we ended as always hail to pit